Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Michael Allman, who is Professor of Neuroscience with secondary appointments in the Departments of Psychology and Neurology uh, at Georgetown University. He is uh, Director of the Brain and Language Lab and Director of the Georgetown EEG ERP Lab. The Brain and Language Lab aims to elucidate how language is learned presented and processed in the mind and brain. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Gil. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing this uh, from Germany. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want to start with one of your book chapters, um, the declarative procedural model, I guess sometimes called DP model, a neurobiologically motivated theory of first and second language in which um, you start off saying in evolution and biology, Previously existing structures and mechanisms are constantly being reused, and that is co-opted for new purposes. So you are arguing in this chapter, Michael, if I understand this correctly, that the, the circuits in the brain that appear to be involved in language learning um, and, and language reproduction are, are circuits that, um, that we have been using for other purposes. So it, it's sort of... Um, even predates Homo sapiens, right? Uh, that's correct. So the basic idea is that given that in evolution and biology, uh, existing mechanisms or systems tend to be reused for new functions rather than completely de novo mechanisms appearing from scratch, that should be the case for language as well. And simply we focus on these two learning and memory circuits often referred to as declarative memory and procedural memory, because these are arguably the two most important learning and memory circuits in the brain. And most, if not all, of language has to be learned. And therefore, it seems reasonable to predict that language should therefore be learned importantly in these two learning and memory circuits. And these are really old circuits, as you were saying. So you can find these circuits or precursors to them in uh, other vertebrates. So for example, um, this, the, the circuits um, uh, underlying procedural memory rooted in a structure called the basal ganglia are what help songbirds learn their songs. Yeah. Or uh, in declarative memory, also in this example in birds, though they both exist in mammals, of course, um, uh, declarative memory helps uh, birds remember, for example, where they stash their acorns. So these are old circuits, and the basic idea is these have been reused, co-opted for this new function in Homo sapiens, even if they might have become somewhat more specialized for language, right? So they could be they could have been co-opted for language without being changed or with some further changes for this particular domain. Yeah, that's that's fascinating because um, often we think of language as uh, something very unique to to humans, uh, 
And uh, and so if this theory is correct, Michael, and I think there is enough empirical evidence it is, um, it basically means that we had the hardware and we sort of stumbled onto language and started using the existing hardware uh, before language. That's right. And it's not exactly clear to what extent there might be additional specializations for language, right? So you can ask the question, well, why don't, um, if this is correct, why don't mice uh, have, have language, for example, or songbirds? Um, and we don't know the answer to that. You know, it's probably some combination of the circuits becoming more specialized, um, additional uh, circuitry in the brain uh, 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 evolving, for example, the massive uh, frontal, lobe develop, frontal lobe development in humans that maybe gives these circuits, circuits more to work with or something like that. But the bottom line is that language is rooted in these pre-existing circuits, even if something new also developed. Yeah, so I want to uh, dig a little deeper into these two circuits. So declarative and procedural circuits. And uh, they're both, um, both involved in memorization, uh, but in different ways, right? So how do you differentiate between the two? So the way that we define the two learning and memory systems is uh, neuroanatomically. So it's quite a, a precise definition. So we define declarative memory as the learning and memory that are rooted in the hippocampus and associated circuitry, other yeah. structures connected to the hippocampus, and procedural memory as the learning and memory that are rooted in the basal ganglia and associated circuitry. And so basically we're saying whatever learning happens in the hippocampus and uh, connected structures is declarative memory and analogously for procedural memory and the basal ganglia. Now this is somewhat a more precise and more testable um, definition of the two learning and memory systems that have traditionally been used, uh, where, for example, there's a more, a lot of times in the past, declarative memory was simply defined as the learning and memory that is explicit, that we have conscious awareness, that we can verbalize, that we can declare, hence the original name, uh, and procedural memory as kind of implicit non-learning, uh, uh, that is learning of stuff that's not available to conscious awareness. But our definitions yeah. are much more precise. And if you'd like, I can also talk about what these circuits, what these brain structures in the actually are, like where they are in the brain. Yeah, yeah, that that that'll be good, Michael. Yeah, just just very uh, very briefly, you know, how they're where, where they're located, and and do they interact with each other? And also, um, is there a specialization between short term and long term between these two circuits? Right, so I'll try to answer all of that. How to remember it by declarative memory, all of your questions. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so, first of all, the hippocampus is deep inside your brain in the middle part, the so called medial part of the temporal lobe. So, you have your temples just under your ears, right? And the temples are Call the temples because they're on the temporal bone in the skull, and below that is the temporal lobe, and kind of you go deeper in to into the towards the inside of the brain, and that's where the hippocampus is. So deep inside the brain. Similarly, the basal ganglia are a set of interconnected structures with names like the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and other structures that are deep, deep inside the brain. Mm. Declarative memory seems to be specialized for learning arbitrary bits of information and associating them, such as acorn in that tree for the bird, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas procedural memory seems to be specialized for learning things like sequences and rules, such as, for example, the sequence in a bird song, to go back to my previous example. Mm -hmm. And the way they learn is also different. So for example, declarative memory associates these arbitrary bits of information like acorn and tree, whereas procedural memory is more is good at predicting, like what should come next in a song that you're listening to, for example. Hmm. Um, and then I finally, I guess you asked how they interact. So yeah. they interact in different ways. Uh, two of the most important ways are uh, what we refer to as redundancy or cooperative interaction, 
and the other one is competitive interaction or the seesaw effect. So the first of these, cooperative interaction or redundancy, basically is just claiming, just saying that the two memory systems can, to some extent, learn the same task or function to solve the problem. So for example, in navigation, rats can navigate either by learning to automatically turn left at the corner, that's procedural memory, or to navigate towards a landmark, like a picture of you on the wall. And, and that happens in declarative memory. So the two systems are redundant in a sense in that they can both solve the problem of navigation, but as you can see from my example, in different ways. Wow, yeah. And so um, neuroscientists, Michael, get mad when I uh, make uh, analogs to computers, but uh, would it be correct in sort of thinking about this as um, when information comes into the brain, um, does it go into the declarative circuits first uh, and then, um, you know, sort of uh, delegated to the procedural part for long term storage of a heuristic or something along those lines? Or it's not it's not how it works. It's a little bit. You're, you're onto a little bit. So um, both systems seem to be learning at the same time. So for example, at any given moment when the rat is deciding how to, you know, is basically learning to navigate, both systems are learning to the extent that they can learn given the context. For example, if there's no landmark, they can't learn in declarative memory, that kind of thing, where it's harder mm -hmm. to learn. So both are learning in parallel to the extent that they can. However, declarative memory is learning faster than procedural memory. So declarative memory can do what's called one-shot learning. If I tell you that the capital of Burkina Faso is Ouagadougou, and you didn't know that before, then you could learn and remember that right now with one example. In contrast, procedural memory needs many, many examples to learn, like a motor skill, like riding a bicycle, which is an example of procedural learning. And so it takes longer. So therefore, you tend to learn more quickly in declarative than procedural memory. But both are long term. Both in principle could be retained the rest of your life, even though there's evidence that we retain stuff better in procedural memory. So you don't really, you don't really forget how to ride a bicycle, but you might forget what the capital of some country is. Well, yeah. And so, as you know, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of advancement in artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, uh, neural networks and so on. And one of the issues, obviously, is that we need a lo lot of data, a lot of repeated experiments, a lot of a lot of label data for supervised machine learning. So it sounds to me that procedural memory is is acting a bit like deep neural networks that requires a lot of experiments and that data can be ultimately condensed into a heuristic that it could utilize. Uh, whereas declarative memories is not something that we have good analogs to actually in computing. So uh, yes, basically you're right. I think your analogy to deep learning is somewhat apt in the sense that what procedural memory is learning regularities over many instances. So in some sense, that's what deep learning is doing in that they're generalizing, they're learning over many, many examples. So in a broad sense, that seems reasonable. Now declarative memory does that too, but it doesn't necessarily do that. So um, if I tell you that the capital of Burkina Faso is Ouagadougou, you not only might remember that exact fact, but also that I told you, and I told that to you today at this time in this place. Uh, that mm -hmm very specific information about time and place is called episodic knowledge. But then eventually, as you learn that fact that, that Ouagadougou is the capital of Burkina Faso, you generalize over all those instances in which you learned it to the fact, and you no longer remember where you learned it, for example, you just remember the fact. So there's generalization going on in declarative memory as well. And then I would add one more thing, which is that in a computer science analogy, uh, it's historically, people have made the analogy between data and 
uh, programs or procedures in uh, computer science and declare them procedural memory. Again, it's a, it's a somewhat simplistic analogy, as most analogies are, but it does capture something real. Hmm. Yeah, so since so, so I want to I want to try uh, one other distinction to see if this this uh, this is right. So um, when you learn by road, uh, let's say you know I want to learn the capital of country X is Y, um, and I, I'm learn I'm learning a fact by road learning. Uh, it appears to be more in the declarative uh, area. Uh, and but but if I were to reduce it to some sort of heuristic, uh, which is a rule, uh, you know, something that I could apply in a different context, um, that appears to be in procedural. Yeah, does that sound right or no? The first of those two statements is exactly right. Wrote arbitrary knowledge, it seems, must be learned in declarative memory and cannot be learned in procedural memory. The second part is a little less true in the sense that, yes, it's true for procedural memory, that you learn yeah. rules how to do things. In fact, the procedural memory system is often called the how system, right? So that you are you are capturing something there, whereas declarative memory is often called as the what system. But nonetheless, you can also learn how to do things in declarative memory, and that's that goes back to this redundancy thing I talked about before, where in the example, for uh, for example, the rat who can um, learn how to navigate, if you will, both with landmarks and declarative memory and by automatically turning in one direction in procedural memory. So the how part can be done in both systems, but the what, the part, the rote learning really only in declarative memory. Okay, okay. Do we have any experiments that, um, you know, different animal models, including humans, where the importance of these two circuits sort of change? Um, I'm just wondering if procedural is, is more late arriving um, from an evolutionary perspective or not. You know, I don't know which of the two systems is uh, has evolved earlier than later. Um, I guess it depends also on how one defines the precursors. Uh, I can say develop. We we do know, at least I know better what happens developmentally, which was not your question, but I'll answer that anyway. <laughs> um, uh, and that is that in young children declarative memory is not very good. So we don't remember very much what happened when we were one or two, right? That's, there's even a name for that, infantile amnesia. And it gets better and better uh, as we get older during childhood. It seems to be at its peak in terms of learning new information about adolescence and early adulthood. And after that, you know, it's all like, like most other things, it goes downhill. Um, whereas <laughs> procedural memory is... It's, it's less well understood than declarative memory, but it seems to be pretty good early on. And then it seems to decline, learning abilities in the procedural memory decline during childhood and adolescence. So by the time you're a young adult, it's not as good as when you were a child. Um, and so declarative memory gets better during childhood and procedural memory gets worse. And that may explain, for example, why to become a uh, world-class gymnast or violinist, you have to start very early. It's not just the number of years that you practice, but it's when you start, because that probably relies importantly on procedural memory. Yeah, so so Michael, I also wondered, is there any sort of evolutionary basis? So I would imagine a child early on getting a lot of information, doing a lot of experiments, a lot of noise, and um, it, it would be advisable to discard most of it, um, you know, from purely an optimization right. perspective. Is that is that what we are finding or not? I guess that's consistent with what I'm saying. That's consistent with procedural memory being good at learning early on because those kind of activities are very important early to begin to get a sense of the the world, of the rules that you need to interact with the world. Yeah, I want to go into another paper that's sort of related, Michael. So child first language and adult second language are both tied to general purpose learning systems. 
Um, and you ask, do the mechanisms underlying language, in fact, serve general purpose functions that pre-exist this uniquely human capacity? We talked a bit about that. Um, but uh, you also make this distinction between first and second language. I am especially interested in this, Michael, because uh, I grew up in another country uh, almost half my life, had my entire education in a, in a different language altogether. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, reading about this a long time ago. Um, I remember, uh, uh, remember reading about where the, where the brain activity happens uh, between first language and second language. It appears to be in different regions of the brain. Um, there is a translation sort of uh, effect uh, that happens for second, lang uh, for second language. Uh, and a little bit of a timing delay in that uh, shows up as accents, <laughs> I, I read. Uh, is there any of this uh, true? Or uh, from your perspective, how does a first language, second language learning differ? Right. So I think I know which paper you might be referring to. It came out quite a while ago, like two decades ago. Um, and that was yeah. a paper in, I believe, Nature. I think it was Kim et al. Uh, but that's something where they showed that different second languages were activating different parts of the brain. Uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, so clearly true. I think we, um, what we know now um, and what uh, is, I, I guess I'll describe this in the context of this model, is uh, kind of the following. So what we just, what we talked about a minute ago, that is that declarative learning and declarative memory gets better during childhood and learning and procedural memory gets worse during childhood can explain, we think, a lot of the differences between first and second language because a child learning early, by the way, that's not just their first, but an early learned second language. So it's the, uh, on this view, it's the age that they're learning it, not the fact that it's second, um, will be learned largely in procedural memory. And therefore, given that a characteristic of procedural memory is that it's stuff is automatized, will be very automatized. So your first language, or in my case, English as my first language, are uh, very automatized, very fluent, whereas that is less likely to be the case for second language because it's learned later and therefore procedural memory being in which learning gets worse during childhood and adolescence is less available for learning. And instead, that second language is learned more in declarative memory. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, so do we find the the second language of somebody uh, that person is sort of less adept at grammar and things? That's like exactly that? right. So, the one of the main problems of that a second, a late acquired second language uh, learner has, is that their grammar is uh, not very good. Uh, other problems are articulation, so pronunciation and mm -hmm. phonology. All of these crucially seem to be learned in procedural memory in uh, early in childhood, for that is for native speakers or early learned second language. Um, but uh, since procedural memory is less available later on and declarative memory is more available, so that's pushing it even more towards declarative memory. These tend to rely more on declarative memory in later learners and therefore won't be as fluent, won't be as automatized in second language learners. In contrast, words, lexical knowledge, are always learned in declarative memory in native language and in non-native language. So there are sometimes less of a, one finds less, fewer differences between first and second language speakers in uh, word knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, that is really fascinating. So um, a second language speaker, uh, if I understand this correctly, Michael, uh, could be very good at meaning of words, uh, but not necessarily um, you, you know, writing, um, writing grammatically correct uh, yeah, exactly, correct exactly. Correct. and as pronunciation as well. And of course, how good uh, you are, if English, given that English seems to be your second language at English or me at uh, my later one second language, will depend on different factors. 
uh, as well. So even words will not be learned that well if you learn them too late, right? Because declarative memory starts yeah. decreasing in its learning abilities in starting in early adulthood. So if you start at age 40, it's also difficult. And also, of course, how much exposure. So if you're constantly uh, being exposed to words in English, in your case, then you are likely to have a very, very good lex knowledge of English lexical um, uh, uh, knowledge. Um, but if you have less exposure, you'll have less of that. But in that view, it's less the age as the amount of exposure that matters, at least for lexical knowledge. Yeah, this will be an interesting experiment, Michael. I remember uh, because I picked up English um, much later, um, you know, to to um, to write uh, graduate uh, exams. That I did a verbal uh, part in that exam. Uh, the only way I could do that is to go back to the dictionary and uh, and learn word meanings one by one. <laughs> and uh, and apparently, a lot of people do that. Um, you know, uh, to, to get and you were exams. able to do it apparently, right? Yeah, able to do that. So, I, I, um, presumably, I'm just using declarative part of my mem exactly. memory part there, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so is the brain? Um, so, let's say you know you learned your first language in the first ten years, and you're trying to pick up a second language afterward. Is the brain sort of making do with the the rules and heuristics and grammar that it has stored in the in the procedural part uh, of the first language and and trying to use it as a as a proxy? It's a great question. One? Uh, we don't know. There is what's called transfer between uh, first and the second language, or between second languages. But uh, to what extent, and moreover whether that is actually taking place for knowledge in declarative and or procedural memory is less clear. So yes, that's an absolutely a possibility. So for example, if uh, there are similar uh, rules, grammatical rules in one's first language and one's second language, one may be able to apply them, um, but it's not entirely clear that that's actually happening. Okay, okay. and. Um, so perhaps uh, I know that in in EU, um, similar languages, uh, perhaps uh, Spanish, French, and so on, uh, people appear to be able to master those languages very easily. Um, whereas it's much more difficult, you know, uh, to pick up Chinese, for example. So it is sort of grammatical. Um, consistency or similarity um, be seeing between languages and the ease of picking up a second language sort of indicate uh, the brain is brain right. doing and, that. And there could be different reasons for what you're describing, uh, including, for example, uh, lexical similarity. So a lot of European languages uh, have lots of uh, cognates in common, right? So there are a lot of words in common, which means that learning the words of that language may be easier, which in turn may then facilitate learning the grammar, because once you have the words, it's easier to learn the grammar. Uh, whereas, of course, in Chinese, um, as compared to Western languages, there's very little lexical overlap. There are very few cognates. And then, of course, you have other differences, such as the tones in Chinese, which make it more difficult, the writing system, which makes the whole language less accessible very often, and then mere exposure. So if you're living in Europe, let's say it's a good example, might be in the Netherlands. So the Dutch are seem to be quite good. Uh, this is anecdotal evidence on my part, given my experience. I think, I think it's more or less true. <laughs> the Dutch are very good at, they tend to know English and often French or, and or German. And that is probably because of exposure to a large extent, right? Because they are actually are watching <laughs> those you know, television programs from those countries, they watch movies in English and so on. Um, so they have a high level of exposure from childhood, right? And so they learn it. Whereas, you know, in the United States, most people are exposed only to English. And even in the Netherlands, they aren't exposed to Chinese. And then of course, there's also, there's also other factors like motivation, right? So, and motivation has, they have different levels of effects, including simply being make sure you're exposed, right? So if you want to learn a language, just studying it or um, listening to to uh, recordings or movies and so on um, because you're motivated can increase experience and therefore learning. 
Great, great. We'll take a quick break, Michael. When we come back, we'll talk about your other paper uh, regarding developmental disorders. Absolutely. Language. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Uh, Michael, we are talking about uh, the brain, how it, um, how it uh, learns language, uh, how it uses language. And uh, there apparently are two different circuits in the brain, the declarative and procedural circuits. Um, uh, and the combination of, the, uh, of those two are sometimes called the DP model. And um, um, there are some differences as to uh, how they specialize in, but more importantly, these are circuits that appear to exist uh, pre-homo sapiens and may be co-opted by humans uh, for language purposes and, uh, and now further specializing in that area. One of the things, before we go into the, your next paper, Michael, one of the things I want to touch on is accents. And uh, I remember the paper that you mentioned uh, 20, 25 years ago, also making the argument that when you pick up a second language, uh, typically when you talk in that language, you have to first formulate your thought in your first language and sort of translate that into the second. And, um, you know, even though the brain is pretty powerful, there is, a, there is a little bit of a time delay in it. And that shows up as accent. Do we have any evidence for this to be true? No, I don't think that that's likely to be true. I do think, however, that uh, we are often slower in the second language than the first language. And one important reason for that is, you can word this in a couple of different ways, I guess. One is simply it's less well learned, so it's slower, but more specifically to the extent that the second language depends more on declarative memory, which we think it does, as we discussed in the previous segment, more yeah. than first language, and declarative memory is often slower than procedural memory, that will result in slower processing on average in the second and the first language. Okay, so, so yeah. I just want to, and so the, I, I got the impression that the declarative uh, memory is faster to learn, but are you saying it's slower to reproduce? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. It's faster to learn, but slower at processing. So oh. the, it learns. So going back to my example before, you can learn that Ouagadougou is the capital of Burkina Faso after one exposure, after I just said, but you might be quite slow at retrieving that information. So if I ask you, what is the capital of Burkina Faso? It's not, you're not likely to retrieve the answer extremely quickly. You have to look mm -hmm. for it, you have to try to recollect it. Whereas for learning a motor skill, like learning to bike or to drive or to type or something like that, it takes a long time to learn. But once you've learned it, you tend to be quite, have it, it tends to be quite automatized, quite mm -hmm. rapid, quite reliable. Yeah, yeah. So, so do we have any voluntary, um, um, you know, effect on that? Uh, what I'm thinking is that, you know, <laughs> for example, when students study close to the exam, I would imagine they're trying to use their declarative memory, uh, but they might be more efficient in learning the concepts if they can push that into the procedural side, right? Do we have any control over that? So it's an interesting question. So I mean, there's some kinds of things that we learn that can only be learned in declarative memory. And I briefly alluded to that earlier, like fact, yeah. right? Arbitrary stuff. So the kinds of knowledge, of fact-based knowledge that we are often tested on in academic settings, that is really learnable for the most part, probably only by uh, declarative memory. Mm -hmm. So there, what you can do is you can try to improve the learning and retention declarative memory by various means. And we can talk about that, things called spacing or the testing effect. But it's 
probably hard in most circumstances to push that into procedural memory. On the other hand, there are some things you can't, right? Our whole research program indicates that grammar is learned either in declarative and procedural memory, right, as we've been discussing. And so there, there are probably ways of pushing grammar learning in more into procedural memory so that eventually it'll become more automatized. But that would probably take a while to do. So you have the decision of what, in some sense, of whether you want to study longer, have more experience, and then eventually have it automatized or learn more quickly and have it be learned in declarative memory. Um, but then have recollection be a bit harder. Right, right. Okay. Um, I want to touch on your other paper um, entitled The Neurocognition of Developmental Disorders of Language. And you say develop developmental disorders of language include developmental uh, language disorder, dyslexia, motor speech disorders, such as articulation disorder, and stuttering. Uh, these disorders have generally been explained by accounts that focus on their behavior rather than neural characteristics, their processing rather than learning impairments, and each disorder separately rather than together, despite their commonalities and comorbidities. So, um, so, so you are uh, um, you are going into sort of a brain-related um, explanation for these disorders. Uh, exactly. So the. One way of thinking about a couple of ways we can things we can say here. So one is that this hypothesis, which we call the procedural circuit deficit hypothesis, is built upon the broader declarative and procedural model of language that we've been discussing. So yeah. given that model, which broadly claims that words are learned in declarative memory and grammar, at least once it's automatized in first language, depends on procedural memory. Given that, then we're saying, well, if there's a neuroanatomical abnormality of the basal ganglia underlying procedural memory, then that will make it difficult to learn stuff in procedural memory, including grammar. And that's what we think is going on in these disorders. And as a result, those people will have problems with grammar and uh, pronunciation, for example and instead may try to compensate with declarative memory. But because declarative memory doesn't uh, automatize learning what's learned in declarative memory as much as procedural memory, then they never quite get to the point that someone without these disorders would get to. So to reiterate, it was a bit complex to reiterate, basically the idea is these disorders we think are associated with brain abnormalities underlying procedural memory. So they have problems with things that depend on procedural memory. And although they can compensate to some extent in declarative memory, that compensation doesn't make up for their, their losses. Oh, wow, okay. And so, so all of this, uh, dyslexia, motor speech disorders, um, such as articulation disorder and stuttering, all of these, uh, you are, you're arguing that um, there is a deficiency in the procedural um, mm -hmm memory part. And, and because of that, uh, they, they try to use the declarative uh, uh, part, uh, but it's so slower, right? From a, from a retrieval perspective, it's slower. And so is that the fundamental reason? Uh, for example, stuttering, I'm thinking about stuttering, for example. So we don't, we don't think that all of these disorders are fully explained by this idea. Uh, the one that is best studied is the uh, is the language, um, the one that's most closely tied to language more broadly, which is called uh, these days developmental language disorder. It used to be called specific language impairment, and that's the one we and others have studied most with respect to this idea. And there, there really is pretty strong evidence that much, not probably not all, but much of the phenotype, many of the symptoms, the characteristics of children and even adults with developmental language disorder can be explained by this procedural circuit deficit hypothesis. It's less clear that it ha that this hypothesis has as much explanatory power, that it can explain as much for dyslexia, dyslexia or speech motor disorders such as stuttering or um, other ones, uh, but it does seem to explain some of that, uh, some of the, the pattern that one sees, patterns one sees in these disorders as well.
Yeah, so so have you um, seen any data on, uh, is it, um, uh, can, can people improve on it? Uh, I'm thinking, as you know, President like Biden had mentioned that he, he had a stuttering issue uh, early on and uh, now it doesn't seem to create a big issue for him. Um, so is this something people consciously train on and, and improve on? So we've looked at this, the literature less uh, for this, for stuttering than some, for some of these other disorders, this particular question you're asking. But in general, what um, I think a reasonable way of thinking about this is that to the extent that these problems are due to abnormalities in the brain structure underlying procedural memory, there are two ways, not just one way, but two ways to at least partially overcome the ensuing problems. One is to, is it's not the case necessarily that procedural memory is completely defunct. Just because there are abnormalities doesn't mean you can't use it at all. Just because I have a my hand is smashed doesn't mean I can't use my hand at all. It's not all or nothing necessarily, right? And so with enough practice, maybe of the right type, speech uh, language therapy and so on, that procedural memory system can eventually learn. And then in addition, declarative memory can learn and that is often more intentional. So for example, for stuttering, one can learn strategies to overcome the stuttering um, in, Tourette syndrome, which we only talk about briefly in that paper, with cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy, one can learn strategies to avoid the tics and so on. So yeah. one can really use both systems, we think, to overcome problems that are due even just to procedural memory in these disorders. Are there therapeutic approaches, uh, Michael, since we know the, the sort of the location of the circuits? Um, can we activate that using uh, any, thought, any sort of therapeutics? Absolutely. And we've talked about that a little bit in these papers. There's another paper um, that might be useful for people interested in this. Actually, two other papers. One is Ullman and Pullman, 2015. The other one is mm -hmm. Ullman and Lovelet, 2018, I think, that uh, address yeah. these issues. So, for example... If one wants to enhance learning in declarative memory, for example, in these disorders, or in second language learners, for example, um, or in other situations, um, there are various behavioral and as well as pharmacological approaches that can do that. We know some uh, drugs, some pharmacological agents that can enhance declarative memory or for procedural memory, the same thing. So there are ways of pushing for encouraging for enhancing learning in one or the other system. I mentioned a couple of those before briefly, a couple of behavioral approaches, spacing and yeah. testing effect. So the spacing effect, this may actually interest many of your, your uh, listeners more generally, it's very useful if they haven't heard about this. So the spacing effect, um, also called distributed practice, these are more or less synonymous. Uh, refers to the fact that if the information that you are learning is presented to you in a spaced out fashion, you will remember it longer in the longer term, you remember it better in the longer term than if it was presented one after the other. So if I say, wagadugu, 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 you'll remember that less well a few months from now than if I say wagadugu, and then tomorrow I say wagadugu and the next day. So that's the spacing effect. And that seems to very much improve learning in declarative memory. It might a little bit in procedural memory less clear. And then the testing effect is um, basically if I tell you, if I say Wagadugu, you will remember it less well in the long run than if I ask you, what's the capital of Burkina Faso? <laughs> so <laughs> I get it. Wagadugu, right? So even if you fail to retrieve it, the fact that you're trying to just the testing yeah. effect, testing it. That's why it's called the testing effect, um, also called retrieval practice, um, um, is um, uh, helps uh, with long-term retention, and that seems to be specific to declarative memory. So there are ways of improving learning, enhancing learning and retention in one and or the other memory system using both behavioral and other approaches, including pharmacological approaches. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, this is uh, this is proven that uh, cramming uh, the night before the exam uh, 
uh, never turned out to be a good thing uh, for, for a variety of reasons, including this exactly. one. Exactly, that's exactly right. So, so actually cramming the night before is actually fine for the test the next day. It's just that you won't remember it in the long term. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, I, I was thinking about the spacing there because you, you probably won't have additional reinforcements, right? So you're probably just reading a book uh, one time uh, because you haven't done anything before the exam right. and then you just do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you do it the night before the exam, it's actually um so so spacing and testing seem to be particularly effective in the longer term, whereas in the shorter term, uh, you know, if I say Wagaduku five times right now, you're going to remember it pretty well five minutes from now. Whereas if it's spaced out over the last five days, um, you might not remember it as well, but five weeks from now, you would remember it better. Right, right. Um, I haven't read other papers, Michael, but um, so the these brain regions, um, there, there, there has to be fMRI uh, type uh, type uh, charts you could create to really look at what's happening. Correct. Right? And so there are different, to answer your question a bit more broadly, there are different yeah. lines of evidence that uh, indicate that that uh, suggests that in fact language is learned and represented and and processed in these two learning and memory systems and one of those sources of evidence is uh, functional imaging evidence mainly from functional magnetic magnetic resonance imaging fmri which for example we published a paper last year tagarelli et al I think it's 2019, which is a meta-analysis of language learning functional imaging studies. That is lots of different functional imaging studies that look at where words or grammar are learned in the brain. In fact, the brain region underlying these two memory systems were implicated as we expected. Okay, okay. Uh, I want to quickly touch on one area that's not, not in the papers. Uh, as you know, um, artificial intelligence is developing quite fast. Uh, there are technologies now that, uh, you know, that can produce, um, um, you know, language pieces or even papers. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to differentiate uh, something that's written by a robot and a human. Um, um, can we actually create uh, some possible tests, uh, you know, there, there are tests to see if, uh, if, if it's a machine or a human, uh, but in this specific context, language uh, writing, uh, in this case, uh, produced by a machine, could that be differentiated somehow because we know what the humans are likely to do? So it's not something I know very much about, and I haven't given much thought about it. However, one thought that occurred to me while you were asking the question, and again, this is in my ignorance, um, is that because these um, machine learning systems are largely based on brute force learning statistics based on the input for the most, almost all of them as far as I know, um, not completely, but I think largely, then, um, one probably wouldn't want to devise a test that contained um, um, input or required responses that were, were, were similar to what is common in language already, because that would have been in the examples that the machines learned from. So one thought that just occurred to me now, I'm sure I'm not first person to bring this up, even if it makes sense, which it might not, is that we have knowledge about language that is not very often applied, used, and that's something, these native speakers, right, and that's something that might be able to differentiate from um, machine learning systems from and humans at this point. Now, who knows in the future, but that's the, you know, that's just the thought I had right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you know, I was also thinking that um, can we assign a reasonable probability that a human would make certain mistakes? <laughs> you know, mistakes may be maybe the wrong wrong word, but um, humans will produce, like you say, uh, perhaps unknown or infrequent combinations 
uh, that a machine is unlikely to do. So if, if I go analyze, you know, um, uh, machine produced uh, uh, piece A and a human produced piece B, uh, I would I would see probably more consistency, more similarity, more structural, let's call it robustness in in a machine um, produced piece. I'm just uh, throwing this out, Michael. Whereas uh, humans may make, you know, more ad hoc uh, changes to it. Uh, do, you, do, do you think that may be yeah, true? Yeah, you know, when you started saying it, I was thinking, oh, that's a really good idea. But then I was thinking, well, of course, <laughs> unless the purpose of the machine learning algorithm system is to be able to reproduce those mistakes as well, because of course in the input they'll have them as well. So, you know, if, if this is a Turing test, right, you know, the famous test to be able to yeah. distinguish between a machine and a human, you can imagine that the machine could have this kind of information built into it so that it also makes mistakes. Um, and then I was thinking as you were speaking well, but then you have the cognitive and other human limitations, constraints that humans have, like fatigue and therefore working memory, so longer sentences might get shorter, or less frequent words might uh, less frequent words might not be um, retrieved as much when you get tired, or things like that. But then I wonder, you know, <laughs> why wouldn't a machine learning system learn that as well if it wanted to? It's yeah. kind of silly to think that it would, but if that were the purpose, for example, to avoid um, being distinguished from a human in the Turing test, then why not? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's sort of a cat yes, and mouse exactly, game. Exactly. <laughs> so, so in conclusion, Michael, you know, I know that you have done a lot of work in this area over 25 years of research. Um, you know, looking at everything that you have done, what has been sort of the, it still remains to be most puzzling to you, uh, specifically related to the human brain and language, the way that we use, use hmm. it. I'm not sure I can answer that question well. I think a lot of what we think we know, uh, we are not very certain of in, the, in this domain, right? These are very complex systems, right? This is, this is not uh, you know, the molecular structure of ceramic or something like that. These are extremely complex systems, very noisy, very variable. And so um, what we think we know is probably mostly wrong, you know, a little bit, right, perhaps. Mm. Um, so that's a kind of a high level answer, basically saying we have a long way to go, even for what we're already studying. Another answer, I suppose, the many possible answers I could give would be to cross the different levels, if you will, um, of, of, um, um, of areas of study in understanding brain and mind. So for example, most of the work at this point understanding language is either behavioral or at the level of what's called functional neuroanatomy, that is what parts of the brain are implicated, but there's very little at other levels, like the cellular or molecular level, which genes are involved. And one of the things that actually I find particularly appealing, you know, my own bias is <laughs> because it's my theory, right? So I'm, I'm a biased person about the declarative procedural model is that um, it does make predictions of that, that sort. That is because we have this independent knowledge of the two memory systems from human and animal studies, including even the genes and the neurotransmitters and so on, we can make predictions about language um, at those levels. So it'd be really nice to start integrating more across these different levels and that's beginning to happen, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Michael. Thanks so much for spending Thank time Thank you so much me. for inviting me, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah, and good luck with this research. Thank you. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.